And uh, so Isaiah chapter 32, if you are there, and uh, I will read 17 and 18. And the work of righteousness shall be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance. And my people will dwell in a peaceful habita- a peaceable habitation, and in sure dwellings, and in quiet resting places. Heavenly Father, we ask for your help, your grace, your anointing. May the true preacher and the true teacher come tonight, who is the Holy Spirit, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You could summarize the uh, pursuit of every Christian that has ever lived or ever will live, you could summarize what the heart cry of a believer is uh, by just saying that they want to walk in the fruits of righteousness. That is, if you are truly born again, then the Holy Spirit is living within your life, and what the Holy Spirit yearns for is to produce in you, to produce in me, the fruits, I I I shouldn't say produce, but give us access to the fruits of righteousness. When you deal with this subject of righteousness that is so vast, and when you begin to try to grab a hold of it from the Word of God, it is just so vast, and uh, wrapping any kind of, you, you almost just have to, Uh, decide to take a piece out and start there and then develop from there and that's kind of what we're going to do tonight but but in Isaiah chapter 32 and verse 17 it says this it says as we've already read and the work of righteousness shall be peace that's the inner effect and the effect of righteousness this is the outer one quietness and assurance forever so the Bible is teaching us the word work there actually means labor. It means that righteousness is to labor in you. And what it really, righteousness is not a a person. It is the working of the Holy Spirit. But what releases the Holy Spirit to labor in you, to produce the fruits of righteousness, is correct faith. When when, uh, we, we begin to manifest faith in what Christ has already done, not trying to reproduce Uh, and trying to win a victory that's already been won on our behalf, when we start to manifest faith in what Christ has already done, that allows the Holy Spirit now to begin to labor within you because there's only one of two people that are going to be laboring in your life to produce righteousness. One is you or the other one's the Holy Spirit. Those are the only two. And you can't, and I can't, but the Holy Spirit can. You and I cannot produce in ourselves the fruits or the effects of righteousness. You could really just take Isaiah chapter 32, uh, 17 and 18, and you could almost stop right there and shout over it. Because the Bible says that I'm going to have the inner labor of the Holy Spirit or, or righteousness in me, producing, laboring in me to produce and to create in me all that Christ died to make me. And then the other is that there is going to be an outward effect. What people see on the outside is quietness and assurance forever. The word assurance is just what it says. It means I'm always being assured. I'm not afraid. There's no fear. I'm always being assured on the inside. Do you know why that in modern Christianity we so need people? Now people, we do need each other to a degree, but there's things we can't give each other. And the reason why is because we're looking for assurances that only the Holy Spirit can bring you. Your your spouse, no prognosticator, nobody can tell you what the future is going to hold. Nobody can make you quiet on the inside. Only, Only the Holy Spirit producing this in you as a product of faith in what Christ has already done. So I want to get into tonight explaining a little bit righteousness from the book of Romans. So if you would turn there, and what we're going to attempt to do tonight is we're going to attempt to lay a foundation of righteousness from the book of Romans, and then we're going to get into uh, how we enter into the righteousness of faith. Because there's only one of two ways that men try to be righteous, or that men attempt to enter into the fruits of righteousness. One is to try to create it in myself, 
to try to be righteous, and the other one is to believe by faith that I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. One works and one doesn't work. And, and if, if I believe I am the righteousness of, Christ, of, of God in Christ Jesus, I believe that, and there's, there's something that has to happen in my life to create the foundation where I, I'm going after it by faith. And the truth is nobody will ever pursue it by faith until they pursued it by works. And once works has failed and we believe that we cannot enter into the fruits of righteousness by works, then we will attempt to do it by faith. How many have, enter, have, have attempted to enter into the fruit of righteousness by works? Anybody? Come on. I, I, was, I, was, I, I taught this in, uh, not exactly this, but I taught something along this line in Republic on Sunday morning. So go to Romans chapter 5 and verse 17. Romans chapter 5, and let me just tell you something. As much as I have taught this and studied it on my own and, and tried to understand it more and more and more, I am still in a learning process. So it's kind of like a doctor practicing medicine. They're learning while they perform it on you. You know, isn't that comforting? Well, uh, I, I'm still learning while I'm preaching it to you. So anyway, Romans chapter 5 and verse 17, it says, For by one man's offense death reigned by one. Much more they receiving the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. What Paul is saying here is that you and I do not, we are not sinners because we sin. We are sin, we, we sin because we are, did I just get that backward? Okay, okay. So we do not sin beca uh, because we're sinners. We are, no, how, what am I trying to say? I'm getting this backward, aren't I? We're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're a sinner. So what Paul is saying is, there is the nature of sin in us before we come to Christ, right? How, how many had to make yourself sin before you got saved? How many have had to make yourself sin Sometimes, even as a believer, how many have to work on, think about, and try to make yourself do something wrong, think wrong, act wrong? That's not, that's not what you do. It is in your nature. And what you had to do is you had to try not to, correct? Yeah. How many, how many have people have ever thought to yourself, I do not ever want to be like my father or my mother? Anybody ever thought that? Don't raise your hand, because it might be on camera and your parents might see it. But... You know, now I've got something on a whole bunch of you. I can use that against you. No, I'm just joking. But, but, and yet, there is genes. There's genes passed down. And no matter how much I may want to work to try to not look like my dad or be the same height or do the same things or have the same build, there are these things called genetics. And they predetermine things. And so I don't have to work to be like them, I would have to work to not be. The point Paul's trying to make is in the same way that you and I as a son of Adam, we don't try to sin, we were not making ourselves sin, we weren't working at sin. In the same way when you enter in by faith to the righteousness of Christ, what this is saying is in the same way when we tap into the righteousness of faith, you can have the same freedom in righteousness. You're not going to have to try to be righteous. You're not going to have to think about being righteous. That as you tap in by faith and enter into all that Christ bought and paid for at His cross for you and I to have, righteousness will flow in us. Why? Because Galatians 2.20 says, This life can be being lived through me by Christ. That's what Galatians 2.20 is. I can literally be the puppet you see, but the hand is the Spirit of God. So God is... The problem with American or, or uh, uh, modern Christianity is we are trying to produce by works what you can only get a hold of by faith. You cannot. And so we are, we are in this up and down roller coaster relationship experience with God when what Jesus intended is for you and I to rest in what He's already done, claim the righteousness, of, that we are the righteousness of God 
by faith. We're going to get into this tonight. If we don't get into it tonight, we'll get into it next Wednesday night. But I think when you begin to see this with the eye of faith, when you begin to have revelation, and the, I told this to the church in Republic, that the eternal prayer of the Apostle Paul, that the eyes of your understanding might be enlightened, that you may understand with all wisdom and understanding what Christ has already... Have you ever, have you ever as a mature believer read the New Testament? I've said this to you before, but noticed how little... Not, it's not that it's not there. But there's very little of Paul saying, don't do this, don't do that, watch this, watch that. I mean, it's there. But the far, far, far greater weight of what Paul writes about is what Christ has done. And us entering into that. Before I understood the finished work of Christ, once I got out of the book of Acts, I really didn't receive a whole lot from the beginning of 1 Corinthians, maybe, maybe 1 Corinthians, but, the, but, but, but after 1 and 2 Corinthians, I understood very little of the rest of the Pauline epistles until I began to understand the finished work of Christ. So listen, you and I, faith, by faith in the finished work of Christ, we enter into, by faith, the fruits of righteousness. Now, this word righteousness in Romans chapter 5, verse 17, is a noun. It's a person, a place, or a thing. It is not a verb. He is not talking about acts of righteousness. He's talking about your standing before God. He's talking about God's declaration over you. The Bible says Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto him as righteousness. It means the moment that Abraham manifested faith that God could do something he could not. And let me just say ahead of time, that you cannot enter into the righteousness of faith until you have been convinced 100,000% that you cannot produce the fruits of righteousness on your own. We're going to get into the, the, the new covenant is written, presented, and will only work in the life of a dead, tired person that has tried everything else and has become assured in his or her spirit that there is no other way to enter into the fruits. Philippians 1.11, Paul said that you might enter into the fruits of righteousness. In other words, the benefits of righteousness. Listen, a lot of people teach this, and the only that where they stop is that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's wonderful. But where they stop is, is this is just your, your standing before God, and someday in the great by and by, you'll reap the benefits. No, you need the benefits now. You and I need all of the benefits now. And so the, the new covenant, the, being the righteousness of, of God in Christ Jesus by faith, it can only be fully realized. And if you're here tonight and say, my journey with Jesus has been hard and it has wore me down, that's the way it happens most for most people. In fact, I don't know that there's many people that will ever get away from that being their their experience. Because how many know the I can do man dies hard? Come on. White knuckling it, trying, suffering. Even in our suffering, I've suffered so much to try to be righteous, we're almost proud of it. We're almost proud of the scars. I don't, I don't know about you, I don't want any more scars. I don't want to suffer. I want to enter into, I've suffered enough, and I'm talking about suffering at my own expense. I don't know about you, I'm ready to enter into the fruits of what Jesus purchased for me at a bloody cross. Amen? Are you there? Are you where I am? I am I, I'm telling you something. Uh, well, I'm not going to tell you. I'll tell you some, some other time, but I won't tell you now. Anyway, Romans chapter 3 and verse 26. This word righteousness is a verb. And this to me is powerful. And I... I uh, I have, to, I have three or four pages of scripture notes, so I have to just run through these. And then probably the verse I'm looking for either isn't here or I can't find it, and I'll have to look it up anyway, which is true. Romans chapter 3, verse 26. I love this scripture. Now, uh, this is uh, the word righteousness. It's the same word. It's just translated differently. But in Romans chapter 23, or I'm, I'm sorry, Romans chapter 3, verse 26, it says, to declare I say at this time, his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him that which believeth in Jesus. The word justifier there 
is the word righteousness. It's the same Greek word. But it is in verb form. And what is being said here is that when I, by faith, after being exhausted and tired of being able to conquer the inner man by any other means. Brothers and sisters, God knew you and I. Listen to this. When you got saved, and maybe you've been walking with God for five years or ten years or fifteen years, and there's a struggle, and you think that God went, oh, I didn't know that was going to happen in you. God knew your struggle. God knew your struggle from the moment you got saved. God knew. But what God has to do is to allow you to come to the end of yourself. Because the Bible says that God, the things that God wants to give you are so rich, and they are so powerful, and they are so eternal, and they are so wonderful, that He does not want you to ever be able to take the credit. Why? It's not Him that He's worried about. It's you He's worried about. He has to protect you from pride. And so God, knowing us, has to wait until we have exhausted. How many, how many have found out that the flesh is a whole lot stronger than you thought it would be? Come on. Come on. Are you there? Or do you live where I live? How many of you, when you first got saved, thought, man, I, I know I'm a little bit messed up, and I know i got a little bit of work to do, but, but I think overall, I think I still I, I got it going on. You've been saved a while, you've been walking with God a while, and you have found out that the flesh is far more powerful than you ever thought it would be. The, the, I said this before, if I took this water bottle and I threw it at Chris, Chris's natural reaction would be to do this. Why? Because that's how the instinct of defending yourself. If you don't think flesh is strong... Let somebody talk about you unjustly for a while. Let's let, let yourself find out that somebody's talking about you on Facebook and see how much that flesh still is very lively, still there, right? Amen? So Romans chapter 3, verse 26 says that when I express faith in the finished work of Christ, when I have come to the end of trying to produce righteousness in myself, of trying to enter into the fruits of righteousness through anything I can do. When I'm done with all of that, and I, and I believe by faith, the Bible says now that the Lord becomes the justifier. This word is a verb. It means there's an active power. There's an active working of the Spirit going on in you. Now I have unleashed the power of the Holy Spirit to work in me. And I, I said this last Thursday. I want you to hear this. That, that if you understand the sacrificial system, in the sacrificial system there was the burnt offering and there was the whole burnt offering. The burnt offering was to be offered when I sinned. And it was to be offered and it would be burned away. They would burn it up quickly and it was only a portion of the animal. If you offered a burnt, it was only a, a portion of the animal. But the whole burnt offering, they put the whole animal, skin, carcass, everything. They put all of it on the altar. Some people say they didn't even gut the thing. They just put it all on the altar. The difference is, one is, I, I, I make an offering for an issue of sin. The other is, I have come to know I don't have a sin problem. I have a self problem. I have something far deeper. I have to put all that I am on the altar. Now, the whole burnt offering, it burned all night. And in the Old Testament tabernacle, the walls around the tabernacle were linen. They were not concrete. They were not wood. They were linen. So the believer could get up any time of the day or night, and they could look at the tabernacle, and they could see the glow of that offering burning through the tabernacle wall. And it was symbolic of this, that when I have stopped trying to sanctify myself, and I believe by faith that Jesus has already done it, then listen, the work of that, the reality of that begins to be performed by the Holy Spirit in me. And it's being performed in me when I'm awake. It's being performed in me when I'm asleep. It's being performed in me when I'm in church. When I'm not in church, the Holy Spirit is active and present working in me 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That is powerful. Just before I came to church tonight, 
uh, a lady put on her Facebook page, and I don't normally respond to anything, and I don't even know why I did this, but she put on her Facebook tonight, uh, conversation starter, what does people believe about the Sabbath? And my response is, Jesus was our Sabbath. Jesus was our Sabbath, so he, did, he kept the Sabbath perfectly on my behalf and on yours so that you and I receive the benefits of the Sabbath. Right? I, don't, I mean, I, I, I don't know if you agree with me or not, but that's what I believe, and I believe that's what the Bible teaches. Jesus is our Sabbath. Come on. Amen. Okay, last one. Romans chapter 5 and verse 19. Romans chapter 5 and verse 19 the word righteousness, for one, by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Let me just say something. God is not focused on your obedience or mine. He's focused on Jesus's. And as I enter in by faith to Jesus's obedience, now the fruits of that begin to happen in me by faith. Now, Romans chapter 5 and verse 19 is one of the greatest promises in all of the Word of God. You can stand on this. The Bible says that God is going to make you. He is going to begin to form you. He is going, and the, listen, the difference between Him doing it and you doing it is that Him doing it, He's doing it without your effort except your faith. But you're receiving all the benefits because the the, the word righteousness in 519 is an adjective. It's descriptive. An adjective describes. So what he's saying is, by one man, all of Adam, <clears throat> excuse me, Adam, we were all made sinners. And we're talking about sin that you could see. So somebody would look at your life and by your actions say they are a sinner. But he's saying right here that by faith in what Christ has done, Jesus, by entering into what Jesus has done. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. God's not really concerned about our individual experiences. He's concerned about one man's experience, Jesus. God only ever, cre in the mind of God, there's only ever really been two men created. Adam, the first Adam, the first man, Adam, the second Adam, Jesus. You live in one or you live in the other. You get into one by, by virtue of natural birth. When you are born with all these little babies, these new babies in this church, by, by virtue of natural birth, they're in Adam. They're, God has no grandchildren. My grandchildren are not saved because they're my grandchildren. My grandchildren have to make a personal decision for Christ at some point in their life. But listen, you get into the second Adam by virtue of the new birth. When you get saved, you are placed in. Now, now, now the second Adam, the, the, the power of Jesus and being in Jesus, will only work so much if your faith has not been, uh, if your faith has not been worn out in other things. We'll get into this a little bit later. But Romans chapter 5 and verse 19 says this. It says, by one man, many were made sinners, obvious sinners. But it says, by the second Adam, Jesus many will be made righteous. We're talking about righteous. That's an adjective. In other words, people will watch your life and by your actions say, that's a righteous man, that's a righteous woman, by your actions. These are the great promises of the Word of God to you and me as a believer. Okay, so let's get into how getting righteousness to work. Number one, number one, and you can look at these scriptures uh, as we go through them. Number one, you have to be exhausted and at the end of all else. See, there has to be something in you if you're a believer, especially a long-term believer. There's probably something in you that as much as you've experienced of Christ, there's something in you that says there's got to be more than this. Anybody else? Come on. Anybody? When, when you read this book, have you, ever, have you ever gauged your experience by this book? and said, my experience doesn't look like that book. There's got to be something I'm missing. Because if this was norm New Testament Christianity, and I'm not experiencing it, then there's something, there's something out of kilter, right? So listen to this. The first step, and this is, 
this is the, I think this is probably, you know, some people attempt to preach, and there's a man that, and I listen to a lot of his sermons, and he said a lot of good things. And he was talking about the righteousness of faith in Christ. But the problem is, you cannot fully experience the, the, the reality of the blessing of the fullness, I'm sorry, you cannot fully receive the benefits of righteousness. You cannot enter into it because it's by faith. And faith doesn't come by just wandering. And faith doesn't even come I even just by information. One of the birthing places of faith is the failure of all else. It is the failure of all else. You can look at some people and say, man, why do they have such great faith? And I'm not talking now about to heal people. I'm talking about faith in, in, in Christ and His finished work. What, why? Because everything else to get victory, they tried everything else and it didn't work. And so that's part of what creates faith. Let me, let me start with Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 6. Now you guys have, many of you that have been in cross class, you've heard this several times. But it says, but we are as an unclean thing and all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags and they fade away as a leaf, and our iniquities like wind have taken us away. This is probably one of the most well-known scriptures in all of the Old Testament. And most people, when they read this, they think that probably the concentration of Isaiah was, was on the filthiness of these rags, which we know are, are menstrual cloths. That's what he was making reference to. He said, all of your righteousness is or as filthy rags, menstrual cloths. What it means is, is all of your attempts at righteousness or entering into the fruit of righteousness. That's what we're really trying. Brothers and sisters, let me just tell you something. We're not even just pinning ourselves. Let me explain this. Don't throw anything at me until I fully explain myself. We're not just even talking about just a holy life, even though a holy life is absolutely the target of a believer. But we're talking about the fullness of what Jesus promised for you and I. A mind that is sound. A life that is not troubled. The, the, there are things that, that the believer's been promised to effortlessly live in because of faith in the finished work of Christ, what he's done. So, but here's what I believe, and, I, and I, I heard a man say this, and it has rocked me. I heard him say it about a year ago, and it has never left me. This is what he said. He said, I do not believe that that was what Isaiah was targeting, was just the filthiness of, a, of, of, of the menstrual cloth. He said, I believe what Isaiah was saying is, when a woman has her period, it is proof she's not pregnant. And he's saying this, that no other attempt at righteousness can create something in you. Only the righteousness of Christ can create in you. Otherwise, you are trying to change yourself. You are trying to reform yourself. You're trying. And I'm not saying there doesn't need, need to be some effort. For sure there does. But in all of that effort, how many people, if we were, if we were to know this, how many people in the kingdom of God have spent all of their life trying to change? When the reality is we need the creative power of the righteousness of Christ that begins to transform you from the inside out. It, it begins to transform you even when you're not actively thinking about being transformed. Am I making sense? That, that God is doing this on behalf of your faith. It is being done by the Spirit of God and there is something being born in you. There is something of, of the supernatural changing and transforming. Man, to step over in and, and, and through that door is the most powerful thing that can ever happen in the life of a Christian. But it happens when all of the other attempts at producing righteousness on your own are have gone by the wayside. Go to, go to Isaiah chapter 47, if you would. I was reading through Isaiah... By the time I get through Isaiah, I have so many scriptures on righteousness, its effect, all of these truths. It's just absolutely full of truth. 
the book of Isaiah. It's a powerful book. Listen to Isaiah chapter 47 and verse 13. And by the way, I believe that Israel of Isaiah is a mirror of America today. In the, in the beginning, not that I'm not speaking about this, but in the beginning of the book of Isaiah, it talks about how there would be the loss of the wise man. There would be the loss of men that were wise. And I think about our government today, and I, I think sometimes, you know, I, I can understand a 35-year-old or a 40-year-old politician not really being able to understand some things, but what I can't understand is when you're 65 and 70 years old and you've been in government, you've been a U.S. senator for half of your life, and you're still making decisions that are identity-driven and may be good for a stripe of people, but horrible for the nation as a whole, that bothers me. And what we're losing in American government is people that do not need to be liked. There, there, there's, there's not a need for some kind of self to be propped up, and they need to make the hard choices that is good for a nation. And when you get, listen, when you get government and people in government that all they worry about is being popular and the people liking them, you and I are in big trouble. Uh, that, shut, Randy, shut up. I'm going to shut up right after I say this. That I was just reading today on the news. I'm, I'm 53 years old, and, and I, I'm now interested in this more for my children and my grandchildren. But that they are talking about passing a $3.5 trillion spending bill. This nation had the highest ratio of debt last year in its history, by far. Pretty soon, half of the American economy's income will be needed to just pay the interest on how much debt we owe. It's unbelievable. And you've got people that are giving away, giving away, giving away, giving away, giving away. Anyway, shut up. Okay, I'm shut. I'm done. Isaiah chapter 47, verse 13. Listen to what this says. It says, Thou art wearied in the multitude of your counselors. Let the astrologer, the stargazer, the monthly procrastinator, a prognosticator stand up and save you from the things that shall come upon you. You know what he's saying is? He's saying that the people of that day were looking at all these other places of faith. And this is what it says. He said, you are wearied because of them. You know what the word wearied there means? It means you're disgusted. You're disgusted. See, people that have looked here, and maybe this is the answer, and maybe that's the answer, and maybe this is the answer, maybe that's the answer, maybe what this person's preaching. And what, and what, this is why, I think this is why we have so many Christians that it's hard to preach to. Because they have went after so many things, and, and when you finally preach this simple truth, that the truth, the way of victory over what is inside of every one of us, every human being, the victory over self and the sin nature and the flesh is only found in what Jesus did at, at Calvary's cross. But your faith in anything else has to be worn down. You have to come away from thinking it's in all of these other things, even as a believer in all of these other things. You know, Cindy and I uh, have a very a good friend that fasted for 40 days takes a lot of willpower to fast for 40 days. takes a lot of willpower to fast for three days. Hoping to get victory over something and never did. Why? Hoping to change something about that person. Why? Because that's not where it's found. What Jesus did at Calvary is more powerful than 10,000 40-day fasts. What Jesus did at the cross is the only power that can deliver you from what is inside of you. The power of the flesh. Jesus would take it upon his own body. Because that's the only way the power of the flesh can be broken. Not for a month, not for a year, not for five years, but forever over your life. Otherwise, listen, you've heard me say this a thousand times. Otherwise, what your life is going to be as a believer is you're going to spend most of your energy, time, and revelation fighting what is in you. Constantly fighting and trying to kick down the machinery of the flesh, the temptations of the flesh. But that's not what Jesus intended for you and I to live like. But there has to be, and this might be where you and I are, and I don't want, listen, this is not, we are not to live here. 
And this, this should not make you satisfied with knowing, oh, okay, I'm in the wearing down process, so, you know, don't be satisfied with that. That's not a fun place to be. Okay, James chapter 3 and verse 18. Man, I can't believe how much time I've gone by. James chapter 3 and verse 18. It says, And the fruit of righteousness is sown in them that make peace. Now I want to stop right there. So this verse, the word peace in this verse, is actually the word surrender. It's the peace that comes, it's actually the word that, that comes from unconditional surrender. Now listen, uh, when you unconditionally surrender, it means you don't have the means to continue to fight. What this scripture is saying is the fruit of righteousness is planted in the believer that has come to the end of him or herself. Unconditional surrender speaks of somebody that has fought long and fought hard but did not have enough to win. This is where it starts. You see, the, the reason why coming to the end of yourself is so important is because what produces all of your problems is not, listen, I, I heard a man say this the other day and it kind of rattled my cage a little bit, but he said, the sin nature does not produce sin in the life of a believer. Hear that. Let that sink in for a minute. The sin nature is not what produces sin in the life of a believer. What produces sin in the life of a believer is a change of faith. When your faith changes from Christ and his finished work to something else, that is what gives the sin nature the power to produce sin in us. As long as your faith is maintained in Christ, and what he did for us at Calvary, listen, the sin nature is like electricity that's in a wall, but the, but the switch is not on. It's there, but it doesn't have to affect us. Amen? Amen. Is, that, is that kind of, that was kind of a raw, I mean, I, I had to listen to that like three times. I rewound and rewound. I thought, I, 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 I heard that wrong. Rewound. Okay, so... Uh, James chapter 3 and verse 18 says, The fruit of righteousness is planted in the life of the person that has come to an unconditional surrender. Go to James chapter 1 and verse 20. Now, let, let me, let me uh, use this verse in a way uh, that you probably haven't heard it before. But, well, if you've been across class in Q&A, you have probably. But it says, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Now this verse, in its absolute pure uh, uh, meaning, means that I cannot, through getting mad at somebody, make them be righteous. I might make them act righteous for a little while, but I cannot make them enter into the fruits of righteousness. But this word here, the wrath, this word actually means through being excited or being passionate. These are not means that will produce long-term righteousness in us. Have you ever thought that the reason you have a battle with sin is because you're just not passionate enough? Come on. Anybody? Anybody thought, man, I, you know, it's just because I'm not passionate. I, if, I, if I was just more, and listen, please, I'm not, I'm not complimenting laziness or, you know, being milk toasty. I'm not, but, but what I'm saying is, this is speaking to a man or woman trying to work hard to enter into the fruit of righteousness. Let me get into a couple other scriptures here. Romans chapter 7 and verse 18. We all know this scripture very well. This is, uh, of course, the Apostle Paul. Let me turn there because I don't have it in my notes. Romans chapter 7, verse 18. It says, For I know that in me that is in my flesh... Now. Let me just stop right there. So you know this. We've taught you this. So in, in Romans chapter 7 and verse 18, when he said, For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Now, the word know there, for I know in me, is the word gnosko, the Greek word gnosko. What he's talking about 
is he's saying there has been divine revelation that in my best efforts, in my, in, my, in my best efforts, there is nothing in me that is good, that is going to produce something that, that God can use other than faith. This is talking about works apart from faith. He's saying that this has to be, it had to be revealed to the Apostle Paul. I've been reading this scripture and letting it soak in where Paul said this, where he said, he said, even when I did good, evil was present with me. How many as a believer have tried and even went through times that you've been trying to do good things, or, but there is still like temptation, still things going on in your mind, still things like nipping at your heel type of thing. And so this is what the Apostle Paul says. Let me get to the last one. Romans chapter 4 and verse 16 verse through verses 18. This is, of course, talking about Abraham. And it says, Therefore it is of faith that it might be of grace to the end the promise might be sure unto all the seed. Not only that which is of the law to that which also is of faith of Abraham. Uh, anyway, go down to verse 18. Who, who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations. What's that saying? It's saying this. It's saying that Abraham had to end up at a place of faith when his body could not naturally produce what God had promised. This, this inability for his body to produce it is what gave birth to Abraham's faith in God. And listen, in all of us, there is a journey that God must allow to bring the believer to the end. There's, there's going to be something in your life, I guarantee you, as you walk with God, something in your life that God will use to bring you to the end of all human strength in your life, where, where you will have to in, you entrust yourself in that battle to what Christ has already done. So we're going to get in next week. We are going to get into the, uh, the other prerequisite, I think, to the righteousness of faith, and that is revelation. There has to be revelation. So stand with Thank me today. Thank you for tuning into our live stream. We hope this ministered to you guys today. If you're watching on Facebook, make sure to give this video a like and send this Facebook account a friend request. And if you're watching on YouTube, make sure to hit subscribe and the bell icon so you get notified every time we go live. We hope you guys will tune in next time and hope you have a blessed day.